can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time. I'm going to start this interview off by reading from a forward in a book. And the, the person who wrote the forward says this, that's what Jill Iskell is trying to do with this book, to tell these stories to inspire you to follow their example. Jill and I have been friends for many years. We're about the same age and have often talked about how our time here is much too short and the to-do list is still too long, but we're trying. And so are the amazing visionaries featured in Hearts on Fire. And we have today with us Jill Iskell, the author of Hearts on Fire. Welcome, Jill. Thank you very much. Now, who wrote that forward? Just Bill Clinton. Just Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of people uh, really follow his advice, especially here at the Clinton Global Initiative, and I certainly am one that follows uh, the, the work, the in incredible work that, that is being done. But Hearts on Fire is about a lot of incredible people. It probably starts with the author, and we're going to get to her, but why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I've been inspired by by people that I've had the great privilege of meeting over the past 20 years, given um, the fact that my husband and I have, were able to start a small family foundation. And through that foundation, I became very involved in strate giving strategically. And I met some of the most amazing people who, no matter what times, what times were like after 9-11 in particular, and after 2008, who gave me hope in the future? Um, even when we've when we've been in despair about our global leaders and la lacking faith in our institutions, the people I met and the people who then I decided to write about gave me a real belief that the future will be a better one because of them. Wow, that's just exactly what Rainmakers is about. It's, it's great to be able to get someone on who is talking about a lot of Rainmakers because what I saw in the book, Hearts on Fire, was that they're all Rainmakers. But I gotta ask you this, how did you get the name? Hearts on Fire, mm -hmm. thank you for asking that. Um, so I also wanna mention that this was, I wrote the book as a CGI commitment. And, and so I want to just let, us know, let everybody know that since we're, we're at mm -hmm. CGI. Um, the name came from one of the young women in the book who we interviewed. Her name is Andisha Farid. Andisha was born in 1983 in Afghanistan during the Russian invasion. And she spent the very early years of her life under the most miserable conditions in refugee camps from, in Iran and in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. In Pakistan, she did have an experience of getting an education in one of the camps. When she was returning to her family, however, her father was ferrying people from Iran to Afghanistan to return home. And one of the people he ferried over was her brother. And her brother was in the back seat of the car and the Iranian border guards shot wildly in the air and killed her brother at the time. And Andisha, when I interviewed her, said to me, Jill, at that point my heart was covered in ashes, but now it's on fire. And the reason it's on fire is that she is the founder and director of 11 orphanages in Afghanistan serving 700 children today. Oh my gosh. How did you find her? I found her through this incredible network, Vital Voices Global Partnership. I was on the board of that. She was honored by Vital Voices. That's really how I found her. And immediately I fell in love with her. <laughs> mm. Because remember now, she's one of these people who came from absolutely nothing mm. and felt privileged. And to me, that is just amazing because many, many people who have won the birth lottery don't go the, to the, 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 don't pick up and do what Andisha did. Mm. We're going to um, go over just a few of the stories because I couldn't pick, uh, and uh, neither could Jill, but Jill, in, in doing this, we all, I'm not going to say that it was random, but there's just a few that we're going to tell. Uh, there's so many great stories. Uh, Jimmy Briggs and Man Up. Uh, you know, I looked at this and I and I see so many people who are who men particularly who are doing bad things to women, and then I see Man Up and I say, yeah, 
I like that. So Jimmy was raised in St. Louis to parents from very modest means, and he was the hope of the family. He would go to the Baptist church on um, Sundays and the community, mm -hmm. and, and people would give him a little money because they believed he was going to be a doctor, and he was going to make the community proud and his family proud. And he went to Morehouse College, and it, when he was at Morehouse College, he realized he didn't want to be a doctor. He wanted to be a writer. Hmm. So imagine now, coming from the kind of background he did, he had to go home and tell his parents that. He was going to be, you know, the very first to, to fulfill their dreams. Um, he did do that, and he then got a job with the Washington Post, and that led him to another job with the Village Voice, and one thing led to another, and he ended up being hired by, I think it was Life or Look magazine, I'm sorry, I forgot, um, to go to conflict regions of the world. Yep, and he write about. A, he was an embedded reporter, basically? Yeah. Oh. He was, yes, he was a reporter in conflict regions, and what he learned was that there were these child soldiers oh. who were in, in, who were. 10 years old who were given guns and were killing and he got he came home and he got very disillusioned but he decided he had to go back and tell more stories himself because he owed it to his daughter and so he did that, and today, I'm going to attenuate this whole process, but today he is the founder and director of an organization called Man Up, which teaches, girl, teaches boys um, and men and girls and women through arts and sports about violence against women. Huh. How to combat it. That's... that's did he, did he do that because what he saw of the child soldiers is that the violence, particularly against women, was just a natural thing to them? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he did it because a gentleman, a, a man who was practically dying said to him, you, it's your responsibility to get out and tell the stories, which I'm sure resonates with you. <laughs> yeah, it, it just does. Just a little bit. Just <laughs> a little bit. But he wrote a very touching letter to his daughter. And if it's at all possible, if we, we're going to put it up on the screen, but if you wouldn't mind reading that letter, there was, that touched me when I read it. So I would love to read it. So this is before he, he's making his decision to return and have to travel and go back to Uganda. And his little girl's name is Mariella. You cannot read anything I have written, Mariella, of course. It will be some years till your judgment of me as a father as a man, comes to maturity. When these struggles and sacrifices are put into context, when that time comes, please know that I tried to be the best that I could, though I faltered sometimes, that I wanted to make a better world, not just for my daughter, but for all the daughters and sons of all the fathers and mothers, that I carried you in my heart everywhere I went, that when I walked through refugee camps, hospitals, schools, and saw curious child fighters, I saw you. You were with me everywhere. And seeing you, knowing my love for you, I held to the faith that a world could exist where I would want you to live, where men stand up for the women they love. Okay, Ben. If you, if you watch Rainmakers on a regular basis, you see that we talk with many, many people who uh, are helping women and girls around the world, and the people who are hurting women and girls around the world are almost always men. So maybe if we listen to what Jimmy Briggs said to his daughter, we can learn something. By the way, your book is, is interesting for another reason. At the end of each chapter, there are resources about the story that you just told. Why did you do that? Well, we, I, the, the, the mission of the book was to ignite in others and inspire people to get involved and make a difference in other people's lives. You can do it. I mean, not everybody can be reading to the kids in the slums of Nairobi, mm. but 
all of us have a role to play. So we thought by giving the reader um, access to information about organizations that they might want to get involved with would be helpful for them to mm -hmm. know and perhaps get and do something. Yeah, absolutely. So we started in Afghanistan, then we went to St. Louis. Now let's go to Lake Tanganyika and uh -huh. the Floating Health Clinic and Amy Lehman. Amy Lehman is a trip. I don't if you if you go to the website of the book, sh there is a picture of her. She has on the back of her on her back, her whole back is a tattoo of the Lake Tanganyika region. <laughs> and it she's an amazing story and and one of the things I I'd love for your viewers to know is that the the people in this book have completely different backgrounds from one another. Some came from very disadvantaged backgrounds and others not so disadvantaged. And Amy came from a fairly privileged background. Um, a Chicago family, she went to um, private school, she went to the University of Chicago. But when she was a kid, she had some strange disability. And my guess is that that feeling of being different from everybody made her become the person she is. So Amy became a thoracic surgeon. And she, she became a thoracic surgeon. She went to University of Chicago Medical School. But she ended up, she wasn't able to operate because whatever this disease was, it kicked up and she couldn't do what she had planned to do. Around that time, she traveled to Africa and to the countries around Lake Tanzania. And she came back to the hospital and she saw, this is controversial actually, she saw people getting cared for who really, they were really at the end of their lives. Hmm. You know, people tied up, hooked up to all kinds of machines and, and she had just come from a region that had no, that had no health care available to people. And she said, if we just took half of the money that we're spending here in the States on health care and, and did something for those who don't have access to any health care, we can make a huge impact. But being the visionary that she is, she didn't just want to do just a little something. <laughs> she decided that she wanted to build a floating hospital on Lake Tanganyika. Oh and that's gosh. what she's doing. She's building a floating hospital, huh? And I, well, I can understand why her views would be controversial in the United States because uh, Healthcare is expensive, and I believe it is uh, that most of the healthcare expenses that we have in our life are, are near the ends of our lives. Um, so she is building a floating hospital in Lake Tanganyika, and when you say floating, it, it's on a boat, right? It's a boat because the people who live around the lake, um, that's what they do. They live on the lake and they live from the lake. Mm -hmm. And if somebody gets sick, that's it. So what she's doing is building a huge hospital and she's, it's not built yet, but she has been raising money. She has learned everything that one can learn about shipbuilding, <laughs> engineering. She has engaged partners on the ground. She's just extraordinary. She from, really uh, is. From surgeon to boat captain. Exactly. And she makes house calls uh, from a boat. <laughs> 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 Interesting. Um, all right, so we've gone now to yet another continent. So let's come, let's come back. Now, oh, let's, let's go to Susanna. All right, can we go to Susanna? We right can now? go to Susanna. Oh, let's go. So Susanna DeAnda was born to Mexican immigrant parents and she was she grew up in the San Joaquin Valley of California mm -hmm. and her parents were they were migrant workers. Her dad died when she was about 6 or 7 and mm -hmm. then she lost her mom when she was at 11 when she was 11. So she was an orphan. Mm -hmm. But her mom's final words to both uh, Susanna and her brother were Make sure you get an education. Mm. I can't imagine that an 11-year-old uh, Mexican orphan living in California would have a good outlook at that point. Exactly. She And by the way, very, very, very religious and very close to her mother mm. and, her fa and, and her brother. And the relatives in the region took care of her. Mm. She did go to college. And she was sitting in an environmental science class and the professor was talking about the fact that there's toxic water in the San Joaquin Valley. People turn their faucets on and black water 
comes out of their faucets. And it occurred to her that the people whose water was so polluted were her people. They were the Mexican Im immigrants and migrant mm -hmm. workers whose lives were affected by this. And from that point on, she became an advocate to assure that everybody has the basic right to clean water. And so she advocates and she is a community organizer and she is making a difference in public policy. Wow, because that's a, that's a tough thing to do whenever you take on the utilities of the world. Um, how, does, how does she do that? How, do, how does she have success? Because I'd like to know. I may have some lobbying I need to do back You know, it home. started out, she had a partner, and it started out basically knocking on doors and getting people involved in creating a community-based movement around the issue of the basic right that the people in the San Joaquin Valley have to a clean water supply. Mm. And I mean, it's not 100% yet, but she's partnering with the organization. She's now partnering with government. And uh, she's doing quite well. When you hear a story and talk with somebody, what's the, what's the turning point that says they need to be in Hearts on Fire, Hearts on Fire 2, 3, 4, and all the other versions that you're going to write? I really like that question because for me, it was, there, there are fabulous stories. I, I interviewed lots and lots of people on the phone, many, many whom are doing extraordinary work on behalf of others, really care about improving the quality of life for those who aren't as privileged as they. But there was something about people who I spoke on the phone with that had a little something extra. They were not they they I didn't think of them as entrepreneurs I thought of them as people whose lives had been transformed either at a particular moment in their lives or over many moments and their lives were transformed in a way that they began to feel privileged and hence obligated and responsible to take on making sure that others had the basic rights and access to opportunity that they did. And so that from Amy, who came from a very well-to-do background, to Andisha, who came from nothing, to Jimmy, to a modest background, at some moment they said, oh my, and they identified with the plight of the other. That's outside of business, you know. Mm. That's outside mm -hmm. of social, on of entrepreneurship. So I, I, I didn't use the word entrepreneurship in the book. A lot of people ask me, why not? And, and that's why I didn't want people to feel like you have to be an entrepreneur to do this. You do need entrepreneurial skills, but you don't necessarily need an MBA. It's good if you have somebody in your corner mm -hmm. who has the MBA. But these people were people who along the way were able to find others to support the, their own missions. So and to help them realize. Yeah, and what I'm hearing out of you, I'm hearing entrepreneur, I'm hearing mission-driven, I'm hearing spirit, some kind of spirit. Yeah. But I don't know that I can put a word on that. Um, have, have you been able to identify a word that, that describes this, or is this just a, it's a, a new kind of person? I think it's, I, I think it's maybe a new kind of person. I think that there is a, I think there's a movement, though, I, I, that's, that I'm telling you, I wrote this in, I, I was inspired to write it after 2008. Um, and since then, there, there has been such a burst of energy in this sector that I truly believe that real change is gonna come because there are so many young people now right. going into this with all their heart and soul. They, they really wanna make a difference and they're taking risks and they're not just going into tradi traditional, making traditional choices. And, and there are a lot of obstacles for them. Mm -hmm. But getting right into your field, sociology, what's the sociological difference about this young generation from their parents, people my age? 
there are many, many differences. My, th my, my belief is, is that life has changed, as we know it, for many young people who are graduating from college now and in the past, since 2008. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, a corporate job doesn't mean what it used to mean, right? right. Pensions aren't necessarily going to really be there. So there's a, sort of a lack of trust in traditional professional worlds. And in addition to that, it's a small world now. We're all interconnected. And everybody knows what the issues are around the world. They see the poverty. They see the hunger. They see the deprivation. They see the conflict, the wars. And they want to become agents of change. They're not willing to accept it anymore. This is true. Let's let's talk about some more. We could we could again we could talk about these for hours, and we're not going to because instead I think you should get the book. Uh, let's come to the United States to Vivian Nixon. Well, Vivian Nixon is I. She's a wonderful woman, and Vivian Nixon grew up on Long Island. Again, daughter of people of very modest means, went to college. She came back from college, and she realized she loved the theater, and she had gotten fabulous grades in theater. And her mother said to her, why fabulous grades in theater and not in everything else? You're not pretty enough to be in the theater. Now, I can't say I blame her mother for whatever happened next to Vivian, mm -hmm. but she did spiral downwards. Mm -hmm. And she got involved with bad stuff. And it, she ended up in jail. So she was in jail. She was in prison. She was incarcerated. And there she had that moment where she saw women who didn't know how to read or write, that had children that they weren't able to connect to or see, and really didn't have what she had, which was an education. And so she started in the prison um, a program to teach women how to read and write. And when she left prison, Mm -hmm. She became the executive director of a program which is in the Bronx called the College and Community Fellowship Program, which helps formerly incarcerated women get college degrees and jobs. So they don't go back. So they don't go back. Wow. Can we talk about one more? You sure. Nate Fick. Well, Nate different from all the rest. Nate Fick is completely from all, different from all the rest, and I... I um, I have a special place for Nate because Nate came also from a wonderful background. He had a Ivy League education, he went to Dartmouth, and then he became a Marine and he served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Huh. And when he came back, he wrote a book and he is now, and, and then he went to work for a think tank in Washington. And it was a think tank, um, it's called the Center for New American Security. So he was giving back, he wrote about his experience, he gave back by becoming involved in policy around war. And um, he just is an extraordinary example of what it means to serve, particularly in one's country. And I have to admit that one of the reasons I chose Nate was my own son is an Iraq war veteran. He too graduated from an uh, Ivy League institution, graduated August, um, and in August 2001, one month before, August 11th, 2001, one, one, one month before 9-11, he was commissioned into the United States Marine Corps. If he watches this, he'll be furious at me. <laughs> but today he... He's going to watch it. I'm going to find him. <laughs> yeah. Today he is a, the founder of an organization called Get Headstrong, Suicide Prevention for Vets, and an online company, startup, called um, Hire, H-I-R-E, Purpose, to connect veterans to jobs. Joe, mm -hmm. we could spend hours. I don't want to do that to you, but I do want to ask this. What's next? Well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that here at CGI. And I've been doing work now with people around the globe. My roots are in education, early childhood education. Mm -hmm. And I was a classroom teacher in 1968. And I'm thinking perhaps of returning to the United States and to focus on what's going on here and maybe telling some of those stories. Mm -hmm. 
With that, Jill Eskel, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind.